Reci ti da sad prvo počinje ovaj kratki USA dio. Ok, I hope you enjoyed your lunch and the break. And uh, now we're going to continue. Before our first panel, uh, which is going to be uh, dealing with taxpayers' rights, we're going to have a pre presentation by our friends from the USAID Corporation for Growth Project because, first of all, they helped our uh, event today very much, for which we thank them. Uh, they're uh, our kind sponsor. Uh, and what they understood uh, and what our conference, especially the, the panel which is going to follow this, uh, this presentation, what they understand is that the development of uh, administrative capability of our tax administration infrastructure is something which is key for the creation of a valid, uh, good business environment for healthy development. And uh, they wanted to share with us the, uh, their project and the opportunities which this project might all even offer to some of you. So I would like to thank them for this and to give uh, them the floor to present the, the USAID Corporation for Growth Project. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Westergaard. I'm the head of the USAID Cooperation for Growth Project. Our project was launched just um, at the beginning of this year. It's designed to, it's named Cooperation for growth to um, underscore the word cooperation between the uh, public and the private sector in Serbia. It's designed to implement some of the reforms that were previously, <coughs> excuse me, that were previously um, enacted here in Serbia, and also to help provide uh, further access to finance for small and medium enterprises. It, uh, this project follows on um, the business enabling project that was a seven-year project here in Serbia sponsored by USAID that was instrumental in, um, in helping support the, implementate, or the uh, passage of numerous reforms in the business environment here in Serbia, including the uh, labor law, um, reconstructing the process for construction permits, and um, the passage of the 2015 um, law on inspection oversight. Um, this project, however, is a little smaller and it's uh, focused not on such a broad-based reform effort but more narrowly focused, but we also want to make it deeper. We want to stress implementation of reforms, not just the passage of laws, because we all know that passing laws is, passing framework laws is a really good thing, but unless they're actually implemented and they're felt by SMEs throughout the country, not just big companies here in Belgrade, they really only have limited, um, limited impact on improving growth opportunities here in Serbia. Um, so we are focusing on the implementation of these reforms and um, um, we are also focusing on <coughs> trying to change the paradigm, the discussion, the cooperation between the public and private sector from one of adversary to one of cooperation, hence the name Cooperation for Growth in our title. Um, obviously, key components of our approaches will also include um, sub substantial communication between um, all stakeholders, public-private dialogue, and also attempting to change some of the incentives for, um, for behavior, both on the private sector side for compliance and on the public sector side for enforcement. Um, our goals are primarily to increase the <laughs> transparency of the legal and regulatory framework here in Serbia um, so that the business environment is more predictable and um, more constant for businesses to be able to grow and thrive. Um, this means um, a uniform and systematized application of laws across all companies. It means uh, implementation of risk-based inspections and audits. Um, using risk as risk analysis as a way to um, allocate uh, uh, limited resources on the behalf of the government to really um, focus on achieving their primary re regulatory objectives and obviously in strengthening communication among, among players. One of the things we are um, Focusing on initially, and this is um, this is one of the interesting things about your city project, <coughs> as opposed to some other um, agencies, is that we are um, able to implement projects very flexibly. So we're able to respond to opportunities that, as they arise, especially in the um, as political will um, 
becomes more apparent in the implementation or of, of certain laws and regulations and the priorities of business. So one of the first things we actually are focusing on are continued um, implementation of the law and inspections oversight. And we are working now with four um, inspectorates here in Serbia, um, the uh, labor inspectorate, market surveillance, sanitary, and um, agricultural inspectorates to try to um, better implement the laws that law and inspection oversight that was uh, done before. They, they've certainly made a lot of strides since 2015, but there's still a ways to go with regard to um, fully implementing the law and fully changing the way in which they interact with the business community throughout Serbia. So um, some of the tools we're using in the implementation of, this, um, of these goals are uh, uh, use of checklists and control lists to make sure that all businesses understand what they are being um, assessed and um, um, inspected upon and making sure that it is compliant with law in their respective areas of, um, of enforcement. Um, we are helping inspectorates develop systems that will feed, ultimately feed into Serbia's new to be launched um, e-inspectorate system. The e-inspectorate system will ultimately, we hope, um, improve transparency and uniformity of the application of um, inspections throughout uh, businesses in, in Serbia. Um, Risk-based systems is also a, a key component of the framework law and um, they, the inspectors have made certain strides in implementing risk-based systems but not fully and so we are trying to help them um, develop a um, a risk-based system so that they are able to utilize their limited resources to uh, meet their key regulatory objectives. And one of the most important things that we are also focusing on inspections is the concept that um, inspectors need to act more as compliance consultants through advisory and preventative um, inspections rather than um, punishments and um, shutting down businesses because it's more effective uh, regulation to actually help businesses comply than to eliminate the, the um, one or two or only a few um, numbers of, of non-compliant businesses. So what does that mean for us here in the fiscal policy world? Um, we are open to cooperation with the tax authority, which is one of the reasons why we wanted to sponsor this important event to enable the Serbian tax um, officials to be able to participate with the private sector in such, um, such a widespread sharing of information and, um, and ideas. Um, we'd like to apply some of the methodologies we're using with the um, other inspectorates with, uh, for the tax uh, authorities, and um, which would include uh, systematizing their many laws and um, um, policies, regulations, instructions, so that they're accessible to all tax inspectors, all tax uh, auditors, and can be more unif uniformly applied to the whole business community. Um, we're also <coughs> helping, the, we also would like to, and this has been identified as a, a priority to try to again, implement a, a risk-based system for selecting um, companies for audits as opposed to a random sample of audits because uh, it's, it's, it's better use of, uh, of limited government funding to really focus on those, risk, those that are most risky. And again, in keeping with our name and in keeping with our strategy, we also want to stress better um, communications with taxpayers and improve the relationship between taxpayers and um, and uh, um, uh, the tax authorities, which is obviously one of the discussion uh, topics for this afternoon. Um, another thing we are planning to do with our inspectorates, and we, we are also um, engaging the tax inspectorate or the tax um, authority in this in this plan is um, we're hosting. Um, um, participation in a, a London conference next month on um, um, new uh, inspection reforms um, in London 
and we have a, a large delegation from the uh, Republic of Serbia attending and will present some of the ways in which they've implemented their new laws since 2015. Um, we'll also stress sharing examples with the UK, which has been a leader in um, changing the discussion of what um, inspections are all about, um, moving from um, um, moving, moving from uh, a process-based inspection outlook to that which focuses on results um, and um, behavioral use of behavioral uh, behavioral sciences to um, promote greater tax compliance on the part of uh, taxpayers and greater um, um, interaction with uh, taxpayers by the by the uh, officials. Um, so we have a little time for questions. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them, or some of my staff here could answer them as well. But thank you for your participation. Thank you. Uh, Christoph, could you come and help us with, uh, and I would also like the panelists of our first panel to join us, Gabriela, Dan, Dominic and okay, so uh, I would like to uh, allow our friend Krzysztof from uh, uh, IFA Poland to give you a little bit of more info, as I promised, about the big Polish IFA event next year. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm going to be very quick. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to invite you all on behalf of uh, Polish IFA branch uh, to the first uh, European Regional IFA conference that will take place next year. We are going to start on the 22nd of May, that's Wednesday, in the evening, with cocktail reception. Uh, and then uh, on uh, Thursday and Friday, 23rd, 23rd and the 4th of May, we are going to uh, continue with our sessions and seminars. Uh, the main topic of the conference will be uh, current challenges to income and uh, VAT taxation. Uh, and the venue of the conference will be in Warsaw at Intercontinental Hotel. Yep, so feel invited. I hope to see you there next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before the panel starts, uh, it's always good to, uh, to uh, uh, because I was inspired by our, our sponsors, uh, so just a short uh, information. Uh, all of our foreign guests, and uh, I indulge the Serbian ones to, to do the same at, at, at some point, but we want to share a little bit of our culture, so all of our foreign guests are invited to join us at 6 o'clock. There's a private tour of our National Museum, uh, and uh, you're all invited, so please join us uh, so we can share uh, with you uh, a little bit of our, of, uh, of our culture and uh, the story of, of the place that you came here. So uh, with that... I am going to give the floor to the chair of this panel, Professor Dan Popovic. Thank you. <clears throat> Dear colleagues, let me first uh, welcome you again at the International Fiscal Association Central and Eastern Europe Tax Conference, organized by Serbian Fiscal Society and Faculty of Law, University of Belgrade. Our first panel on the taxpayers' rights in Central and Eastern Europe, co-chaired by me and uh, Assistant Professor Svetislav Kostic, encompasses following speakers. Professor Carlos Vefe, Scientific Coordinator of the Observatory on the Protection of Taxpayers' Rights IBFD project in Amsterdam. Gabriela Rahovnio, the tax advisor and a member of the presidency of the Chamber of Tax Advisors from Brno, Czech Republic. Dejan Radic, uh, Indirect Tax Authority of Bosnia and Herzegovina from Maria Luka, and Professor Dr. Dominik Maczynski from the Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan, Judge of the Regional Administrative Court in Poznan, Poland. Each speaker will have approximately 25 minutes for a presentation on her or his specific topic. We will uh, leave space for a debate between panel members as well as for a Q&A part for the audience. We intend to finish today's session at 5 in order to be able to commence timely our planned social activities. <coughs> 
Before I give floor to the co-chairperson and subsequently to the panelists, I would like uh, to take this opportunity to point out briefly a number of issues concerning taxpayers' rights that some of my colleagues in Serbia and I, myself, consider important at this point in time. Some of them would be certainly covered by our speakers, but anyhow, I would like to table them without a pretension to elaborate them widely, also bearing in mind the Q&A part of the session. I must agree with the statement made by Philip Baker and Pascalic Pistone that generally good administration and the protection of taxpayers' rights will go hand in hand and support one another. Since taxpayers' rights are derived from higher obligations, whether in constitutional law or human rights instruments, where good administration and protection of taxpayers' rights conflict, the latter should always prevail. The developments in the last two decades have raised the awareness that taxpayers' rights represent a genuine part of the human rights corps, and that fiscal interests of the state cannot justify disproportionality between their wide and tough obligations and their rights. One of the burning issues is the right to privacy, including the protection of confidential information from disclosure. Uh, considering the massive loads of information that tax administration possesses on their taxpayers and the sensitive nature of the information so collected, it is a general minimum standard of all tax systems that they take measures to provide such information with protection from any breach or misuse, either by tax administration officials or by third parties, such as withholding agents, that have access to the taxpayer's information. Serbia's law also sets forth that tax officers and other persons participating in tax administrative procedures, tax misdemeanor procedures, pre-investigation procedures, and criminal procedures, must keep all documents information, data, facts, data on technical inventions and patents of the taxpayer confidential. An unauthorized disclosure represents a criminal offense. There is a list of exceptions contained in the tax procedure and tax administration law when the disclosure is permitted, and I will just mention one. The obligation of the tax administration to publish annually on its website information on legal entities and entrepreneurs with outstanding tax debts above certain threshold, including the amount of unpaid due taxes and accrued interest for late payment. Natural persons other than entrepreneurs cannot be named and shamed. There are several sensitive aspects of this legal provision. It establishes on one hand certain balance between the freedom of information legislation that reflects a desire to apply transparency so that all aspects of government activities are subject to public scrutiny, and, on the other hand, taxpayers' interests that because they compulsory supply financial and other delicate information to revenue authorities, they should be entitled to privacy. However, the exclusion of the natural persons from the name and shame list may be seen as a measure aimed at protection of those privileged in terms of their wealth or political status. In Italy, from 2015 onward, all of the annual tax returns of politicians composing the Italian government and certain special commissioners appointed by the government shall be accessible to everyone apart from certain sensible data regarding place of residence or tax code, etc. Additionally, one may wonder whether the disclosure of non-compliant taxpayers is always complete and accurate, or it could become selective for whatever reasons. The second issue relates to two recent verdicts uh, issued by the European Court of Human Rights shed a new light that shed a new light on our well-established perception 
of certain taxpayers' rights and obligations, the first being favorable to tax authorities, while the second seems to enhance the taxpayer's position. In Lindstrand Partners Advocate Bureau, ABE versus Sweden, the European Court of Human Rights dealt with the case concerned a search undertaken on the premises of the applicant law firm by the tax administration in the course of audits that were being carried out on two other companies which were clients of that law firm. The court concluded that the search of the applicant's offices was not disproportionate to the legitimate aims pursued. The interference was accordingly regarding as having been necessary in a democratic society. It followed that there was no violation of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, right to respect for private and family life. <coughs> Serbia's tax procedure and tax administration law authorizes the taxpayer's attorney, tax advisor, auditor, as well as her or his priest and doctor, to deny the tax administration information on the tax relevant facts. The non-disclosure privilege extends to their assistance. Article 93 of the Criminal Procedure Code also grants the non-disclosure privilege to the attorneys and other persons who would otherwise violate the duty of keeping the professional secret. One may wonder what would be the impact of the above-mentioned verdict by the European Court of Human Rights. <clears throat> the second verdict issued by the European Court of Human Rights in Shambas case could trigger reviewing of the existing provision of Serbia's tax procedure and tax administration law, which compels the taxpayer to hand over records and provide all available information to the tax administration under the threat of a pecuniary penalty for the tax misdemeanor. Namely, in Shambaz, the court found that the pecuniary penalty for refusal of handling over the requested documentation violated the prohibition of self-incrimination, which emanates from the right to a fair trial as stipulated by Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Philip Baker pointed out that despite the fact that in the moment when the tax administration demanded the handing over of the documentation in the course of the tax audit, the issue of tax evasion, evasion was not raised. The court took the position that Article 6 anyhow was applicable since subsequent procedures that eventually led to the penalization for tax evasion had to be taken into consideration. Just to mention, tax procedures are generally not subject to the court's scrutiny from the perspective of the right to a fair trial, because a person is entitled to that right only in the determination of any criminal charge against him or her or his or her civil rights and obligations. However, the court in the Yanosevic case held that whenever in a tax procedure be it administrative or judicial, penalizing tax surcharges were imposed on the applicant, the proceedings involved a determination of a criminal charge understood in its uh, autonomous meaning apply. Uh, in other words, in these cases, the right to a fair trial does apply. Therefore, if the European Court of Human Rights finds that handing over documentation in the course of audit represents violation of this right in the form of self-incrimination, how would legislators react? One should pay attention to the court's position that in spite of the fact that the request for surrendering documentation was made in the course of audit before the commencement of the criminal procedure, the taxpayer at this juncture could not exclude scenario that any information relating to his untaxed income could subsequently expose him to the accusation that he had committed the crime 
of tax fraud and thus endanger his position in the investigation. Having said this, I just warn the legislator that defending the taxpayer's obligation to hand over requested documentation against the allegation that it violates the right not to incriminate himself or herself cannot be based merely on the assertion that it is a tax rather than criminal procedure involved. And finally, referring again to Baker and Pistone, I would comment briefly on the taxpayer's right to be discharged from liability to pay the tax where the tax is withheld by a third party such as an employer. These scholars' warning that legal protection is required to make clear that the taxpayer who has suffered withholding will not be liable to tax if the third party fails to pay his over, this tax over, may at first glance seem superfluous. But a recent amendment in Serbia's personal income tax law speaks differently. Namely, as of 1st of January 2018, a recipient of income intended to be subject to a withholding tax, for instance, employee, is obliged to self-assess and pay the tax whenever the withholding agent, for instance, employer, fails to carry out his duty. The employer remains jointly and severally responsible for the unpaid tax, but the tax administration is now entitled to knock directly on the employee's door. I am aware of the Italian Supreme Court's position that the withholding agent's obligation to pay tax does not exclude that the substituted taxpayer is also obliged to pay the tax jointly with the tax substitute. However, I am also aware that almost 99% of the employees in Serbia are unaware of the withholding procedure since their wages and salaries are predominantly agreed in net of tax terms, and they have neither influence on nor insight in the employer's conduct of withholding duties. New provision enabling tax administration to collect unwithheld tax and social security contributions directly from the employees thus violates legal certainty and creates an environment where the discretion of tax authorities may play a major role in the tax procedure, bearing in mind the large number of potentially threatened taxpayers. Having said that, I invite Dr. Svetislav Kostic to continue chairing this panel. Thank you, Professor Popovic. Uh, I would like to introduce to you our distinguished panel today, and uh, uh, I'm going to go in the succession of uh, our speakers. So uh, we have uh, been really meticulous and I would like to, th uh, in choosing what we think are the right people and I would like to thank the panel members for the privilege and, and the joy of being with us and sharing uh, their immeasurable uh, experience and knowledge. So first of all, uh, we have Carlos Vefe here. Professor Vefe is somebody who's, who's bringing to us a, a broad comparative overview from the uh, Taxpayer Rights Observatory uh, of the IBFD where he is uh, engaged in. Professor Befe is also somebody who uh, brings with him a, a perspective of somebody heavily involved in research in criminal tax uh, procedure and tax, uh, criminal tax, uh, the aspects of uh, uh, tax crimes. Uh, uh, next to me is Gabriela Hrashovinova. Krakowinova, sorry, my pronounce, Czech pronunciation is horrible. Uh, she is somebody who brings with her, I think, a tripartite experience. So first of all, uh, she brings an experience from a, uh, of leading a, a big multinational corporation, of advising the tax administration and also being a tax advisor. So you're somebody who has all the perspectives in a way. Uh, I have uh, uh, Dan Radic from the Indirect Tax Administration of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the administration which is in this current uh, region currently leading a horizontal monitoring uh, drive, something which is unique and I think will uh, bring a lot of experience. And last but not least, uh, on my left side, there is Professor Majinski from Poland, who not only has the uh, academic 
background, but is also bringing something which I found exceptionally interesting, and that's the judicial view uh, and uh, the, the perspective of the judiciary. So we have tax administrators, we have corporates, we have tax advisors, judges, and we have uh, uh, in-house tax practitioners all combined on this panel, and I don't have anything more to add in front of this panel. I can only listen, so I will uh, allow Professor Weffer to continue with his presentation. Good afternoon. I think for the sake of you all listening to me, it would be better for me to stand, if you're okay with it. Translators can hear me properly? Excellent. First of all, uh, there is a saying in Spanish cultures, in Spanish-based cultures, according to which uh, people of good birth should be thankful. And I'm really thankful for the organizers as being from myself, from a Spanish-speaking country heritage. I'm really thankful for the opportunity that IFRA, IFA Central Europe has granted both to IBFD and to me, particularly to share with you some of the findings we have come across when research, doing, conducting some research on the practical production of taxpayers' rights through this initiative of IBFD named as under the direction, should I say, of prof both professors Philip Baker and Pasquale Pistone of the Observatory on the Protection of Taxpayers' Rights. And in this regard, and, and based on the uh, assertions that have been made uh, previous to my speaking to you. I think we can all agree that at least from December 1948 we all agree on human dignity and freedom as ground reasons, as basements of law in every single democratic country there is. And in that regard Human dignity and freedom are, based, are fundamental basis to analyze, to establish, and further develop the relationship between power and citizens in all aspects in which these relationships can develop, particularly in those relationships where the state powers can be most directly influencing human beings, that is, criminal penalties, and how, if not, uh, taxes. In this regard, I think, and I take here as mine the words of both Professor Baker and Professor Pistone, when they say that we have to take into account that at the end of the day, taxpayers are human beings, and they should be treated as such. And that established a very good basis for both attending good tax governance and the legal fulfillment of the duties that human beings have in a democratic society ruled by the rule of law. So the very concept of taxpayers' rights enhance the balance that should be between the different agents that work in a, spe in a specific society to better achieve societal goals, to better help the state uh, for developing his, uh, its activity in order to better facilitate people's lives, and for taxpayers to have relationships based on mutual respect and comprehension and, and cooperative relationship with tax administrations. In this regard, I think from an academic perspective, it's useful to put focus, to study how are these relationships between taxpayers and tax administrations developing? How are taxpayers' rights being implemented in practice? And how can we identify good practices and even better practices, and why not? best practices and how to address and protect these taxpayers' rights. And that's fundamentally the goal of the IBFD Observatory on the Protection of Taxpayers' Rights. That's what will 
what we should be addressing in this presentation at first sight. Secondly, we will be talking about the findings of the observatory in the period com um, comprehended between 2015 and 2017 in four big areas that have, have been requested to us by the organizers of this conference. Confidentiality, reviews and appeals, cross-border procedures, and legislation. We will be giving a very brief overview of what our findings in a general sense were and what the reporters of the countries of Central and Eastern Europe gave us in order to better assess what's the real state of the art when it comes to the practical protection of taxpayers' rights. And in the end, I will be giving a very few closing remarks. Let's start from the beginning. Let's start from the, for defining the IBFD Observatory on the Protection of Taxpayers' Rights and what's its goal. Let's start with some very brief background information. Back in 1990, the OECD endeavored itself in this very same process of both identifying what are the minimum taxpayers' rights involved in the relationship, in the tax relationship between state and citizens on one hand, and what are the duties the taxpayers should be vis-a-vis -vis, um, fulfilling in light of the tax relationship. Based on that initial seminal work conducted by the OECD and published in 1990, as soon as late as 2015, both professors Philip Baker and Pasquale Pistone identified, engaged themselves in in further uh, advancing in such work, and then they, they identified 12 main aspects that comprise both good governance and legal remedies for the better and practical protection of taxpayers' rights that was made in Basel at the IFA uh, conference of that year. And in this regard, they decided, with the support of IVFD, to, to build the observatory on the protection of taxpayers' rights. What are the goals that this observatory pursue? We want to raise awareness on the link between taxation and the, on the undeniable link recognized by the OECD as far as 1990, as I have just stated, between taxation and human rights. Start building with the help of our national reporters a database on the practical protection of taxpayers' rights, and first and foremost, build a constructive dialogue between all the parties involved in the tax relationship. How do we do that? We do that through fact-based reports provided to us by national reporters. Completely, and those are the instructions they receive, completely impartial non-judgmental. We just want to receive facts so we can identify from a, from a scholar perspective what are the good practices, what are the best practices regarding the practical protection of taxpayers' rights and for ensuring that non-judgmental nature, for ensuring that impartiality, we have requested a number of very qualified uh, members of the tax community to oversight the activities of the observatory for keeping consistency and also to provide advice on the activities of the observatory. And we have the honor of counting within this supervisory council with pe people as important and as knowledgeable in the tax community as um, Juliana Cocot, Attorney General of the, of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, uh, European uh, Court of Justice, sorry. Uh, Nina Olson, the Taxpayers' Rights Advocate of the United States. Robert Attard, uh, leader of the practice of uh, EY for 
Central Eastern Europe. Uh, Dennis Davis, member of the judiciary of uh, South Africa. And Porus Kaka, former president of the of IFA. Ha! Now, I would like to emphasize how our work is done when appointing and conducting the work of the national, our national groups of experts. So the means we have to receive the information we, we process in order to identify these good practices and better practices and how to address a practical protection of taxpayers' rights. We want to keep our national teams as balanced as possible. So to the, to, we conduct the f most efforts we can in order to assure the groups are completely balanced. And for that, we co aim to compose them of practitioners, tax administrations, ombudsmen, judiciary, and the academia. Those marked in gray are regarded as uh, impartial. Those marked in colors are taken as non-impartials. And we do our best efforts to make sure that in everything we have practitioners or tax authorities, we have representation of both sides. So to keep balance, to keep impartiality in the uh, gathering of the information and the analysis of the information. For the 2015-2017 period, we counted with 25 countries of all over the globe, as you can see. Although, from Central and Eastern Europe, we only counted with two countries. Poland, whose team, should I say, particularly with, since now that we have presence of the Polish judiciary among us, the Polish team is not balanced. So, and, and with this, I would like to stress our kind invitation for whichever of you that would like to engage in this work and provide us with information by becoming a national reporter of your team and then helping us achieve the most impartiality and the most facts as possible, we will be very, very thankful for that. And like I said, um, from the Central and Eastern Europe, we have Poland and Serbia. Having this said, we should continue to the practical protection of taxpayers' rights in a nutshell. And in this section, I will be giving a very, very brief uh, outline of what were the findings of the observatory in the 12 areas identified by professors Baker and Pistone, putting specific, um, particular attention in four areas that were requested by us for, from the organizers. Confidentiality, reviews and appeals, cross-border procedures, and finally, legislation. First of all, when we talk about Confidentiality in the context of a, tax, of a taxpayer's tax administration's relationship, we talk about the, the necessity of discretion in the handling of information. Taxpayer's information is sensitive information that might affect the position of the taxpayer in the market, that might affect, depending on the context of a, any given country, even all the rights and therefore the discussion of both parties in the handling of this information taking appropriate measures to help assure the uh, confidentiality of information treating exceptions to confidentiality on, on, uh, under narrow uh, specifications in order to best assure that the exceptions to confidentiality responds to what is acceptable, and, and then I'm taking the, the wording of the European Court of Human Rights, what is acceptable in a democratic society are important. In this regard, the report found that 
all across the 25 countries surveyed that there were adopted technical measures to protect confidential information held by tax administrations, although were registered a few leaks of information, which is completely, say, within the possibilities of what can happen with when you handle uh, big amounts of information. It, it is good to say that in those cases where leaks were identified, all tax administrations took strong measures to pursue, to identify the responsibles, to close gaps in the, treat of, in the treatment of such information and to punish those responsible for it. The, from a legal perspective, the, I, the illegal disclosure of taxpayers' confidential information was regarded as punishable by law and laws were specifically enacted to punish the illegal disclosure of this information by either taxpayers or by tax administrators. And in the end, within the exceptions of confidentiality, naming and shaming was generally limited to after a decision on tax, ass tax assessments are final. Within the region, what do we find? According to the reports we received for the period 2015-2017, in Serbia, the confidentiality of taxpayer information in all tax procedures has been provided for, and contraventions are punishable pursuant to Serbian's criminal code. Judicial authorization for naming and sharing is not requested in Serbia, although the information on certain taxpayers with outstanding debts are explicitly excluded from naming and, shame, and shaming. The professional privilege, and that's what regard to the legal professional privilege of, com of confidentiality of the information obtained by the legal or tax professional in, in the practice of his or her profession, the professional privilege is granted to lawyers, clergymen, taxpayers, family members, tax advisors, and their assistants. So, and, and then providing Serbia with a very good level of protection of such right that even uh, it can be said as the general report, the observatory general report says, it meets the best standard in, in this regard. And according to Serbian law, the search of premises containing privileged material is only, reg though, is only regulated in the case of lawyers. Reviews and appeals. If we take the legal, the tax relationships as a tax, and as the tax relationship as an obligation, and then an obligation of, of equals before the law, and then as for people granted rights and obligations, then we, we should take into account with that when a difference on op of opinion among them arises, there should be legal remedies that help the parties of the tax relationship solve those differences having regard of, pr of basic legal principles of procedures such as audi alteram partem, non bis in idem, um, and equality of arms for both parties. In this regard, the findings of the general report of the observatory have observed uh, all that the right of appealing administrative of objections is widely acknowledged throughout the 25 countries surveyed. The right to be heard and to produce evidence against tax claims is also provided for in the legislation, so granting a very good level of protection. Free legal assistance and cooperation in bearing of cuts proceedings, taking particularly taking into account the demands of, from the minimum vitalis and the protection of the right of property, are broadly offered to taxpayers. However, 
Some legislations allow the collection of taxes while pending the decision on appeals, something that brings some questions regarding the effective, the, the possible challenges that this pr collection prior to a final decision pose on the possibility of the taxpayer to act to effectively access the le legal remedies in order of the economic burden this might represent. And the excessive length of appeals appears, according to our national reporters, to be an issue. What are the findings on the region on reviews and appeals? According to the Serbian report, prepared, prepared among others by our very own Professor Kostic, tax authorities are obliged to grant taxpayers the right to be heard before any decision is made. So meeting the best standards in, into practice. The state must bear the preceding cost of the party who is unable to bear the cost without adversely affecting his or her minimum vitalis, his right to property on the first place and in the second place to better protect his or her ability to provide for her own, his or her own basic needs. And finally, although all these are good signs, according to the Serbian report, in practice there is no limit on the length of the judicial appeal processes in the country. Cross the procedures. According to professors Pistone and Baker, this is one of the most challenging issues for taxpayers' rights nowadays because for a number of reasons that were addressed in the general report as well as in the 2015 general report prepared by Baker and Pistone, in cross-border procedures there are not as much developments in the practical protection of taxpayers' rights as they are traditionally, that is to say, as they are in domestic legislation, mainly, probably, because there is no a international tax court that is able to enforce those taxpayers' rights within the context of cross-border um, um, situations, maybe for some other reason. The thing is, one of the most challenging uh, parts of the practical protection of taxpayers' rights is precisely that the one that has to do with cross-border procedures. However, according to the findings of the observatory, what our national reporters reported to us, taxpayers' rights in the context of both exchange of information and uh, mutual agreement procedures are legally considered. In, in uh, what regards to Right, the right to be notified of an exchange of information, the right to oppose to the submission of data about taxpayer, and what, um, and what has to do with the right to know and correct the information provided to, fr to and from tax authorities in the context of an exchange of information as well the legal framework for the automatic exchange of information included in the period measures for data security and that connects with the topic of confidentiality we were discussing previously and finally the right to request the initiation of MAPs has been granted particularly in light of the MLI and the most recent reform of the update of the uh, OECD model convention. What are the findings in the period in the area? Generally, according to the Serbian National Report, the signing of the MLI forecasts changes to its policy regarding MAPs, particularly when it, ha when it comes to the definition of the possibility of the taxpayer to actually requesting a, an MAP to either of the tax authorities involved in a cross-border situation in which 
the taxation applicable might not be in accordance with the terms of the treaty. There is no reported developments in other areas, though. Legislation. There are, according to Baker and Pistone, there are two main issues that has to be taken into account when talking about legislation. One, we may speak of a basic agreement on the prohibition of retroactivity. In order to enhance legal certainty, it's reasonable to think that tax legislation should not be applicable with retroactive effect. And second, as a consequence of the democratic rule of law and the pri democratic principle applied to tax matters, it should be also ris reasonable and in light of the non-taxation non non without representation principle that people should be consulted on, on the legal pro um, tax legal projects before they become enacted by the parliament. In this regard, the findings of the observatory are that there are contradictions. There are steps forward, steps backwards. There are legal and judicial recognitions of the irretroactivity of tax laws, but in the same measure, there are uh, legal and judicial denials of this irretroactivity principle, or should I say, allowance of the legal and judicially the retroactivity of tax law has been upheld. And as well, there are contradictions when it comes to the public consultation of lobbies. In this regard, Serbia appoints, uh, point, points out that less than 8% 8, 8 of all law proposals in the period, that is to say between 2015 and 2017, have been subjected to public, to public discussion. That leave us with 92% of those projects without public discussion. And the Polish report says that if it has become a practice in Poland that the tax legislation is actually drafted by the government as bills and passed without uh, big discussions, let's say, by the parliament. And in practice, according to the Polish national report, avoiding public consultation on the topic. Finally, what can be seen? What is to come? According to, in 2018, we already have some developments on the practical protection of taxpayers' rights that are worth noticing. The European Court of Human Rights delivered their decision in the case of Cacciato, and sorry to the Italians present if my Italian pronunciation is not that good, Cacciato versus Italy, according to which, related to the, protect, the practical protection of the right on property on a substantive approach, it is possible to tax the indemnization received by someone due to expropriation. So uh, there was this, this asset that was expropriated by some municipality in Italy, and then the municipality wanted to tax the proceedings of expropriation and then the indemnization received by the taxpayer. According to the European Court of Human Rights, this is not tantamount to a violation of the taxpayer's right to property according to Article 1 of the, pro of the first protocol of the European Convention on Human Rights. And when it comes to criminal and administrative sanctions, when it comes to the protection of the non vicinidum principle, the impossibility of double jeopardy, the, pro the prohibition of double jeopardy, the impossibility of both punishing someone twice for the same offense based on the same 
grants the same principle, the, the same basic grants for the, the society's life to be protected, that's from a substantive approach. And from a procedural approach, the impossibility to prosecute twice the same person for the same facts. In that regard, the Court of Justice of the European Union delivered a decision in the case of Luca Menci, according to which non bis in idem admits exceptions by operation of law due to the public interest involved in the collection of VAT, provided that they don't alter the hard core of, of the right. And that, according to the Court of Justice's decision, it's pretty much uh, summarized in the certainty that the taxpayer has of the double prosecution and the possibility of double sanction that he, he or she gets from his or her previous knowledge of the law that actually provides for the double prosecution and for the double punishment. And that raises some questions. That's, that's, at least for me, it's pretty obvious. This is pretty much a summary of the findings of the observatory on the protection of taxpayers' rights. I think these few aspects uh, we have shared will help uh, set the table for the interesting discussion that, we, that the panel will have. And I would like to insist once more in inviting you in both uh, contacting us, uh, having access to the materials produced by the observatory that are currently online and, and are easily, you can download them, download them right now if you want. And if you want, if you feel that you have something to say regarding the factual protection of taxpayers' rights from whatever perspective you want. As, as I said, the, the first and foremost goal of the observatory is to preserve our impartiality in, the, uh, in addressing these issues. Then I will invite you all to please say so and please become national reporters for the observatory. I think, as Professor Kostic said, a few minutes ago, there are many, many things that Central and Eastern Europe has to say, and there are many, many things that Central and Eastern Europe, Europe has to provide for. And I think this is a very good opportunity to let the rest of the world know about it. This is all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Yes, please. But please use the microphone. So, uh, when it comes to double jeopardy, you mentioned earlier, uh, it's not double jeopardy per se in Serbia, but I'm just you know, wondering whether this is on the scope of the observatory. So, in Serbia, we have a specific situation where you have default interest levied by the tax authorities in case you are late with paying a given tax liability, but there is also a possibility of a pecuniary fine being levied for the same tax offense, so to speak. So, in essence, uh, you're being penalized twice for the, same, for the same situation. And just to elaborate a bit more on the default interest, so it's not a market level interest, it's a default interest is consisted of a let's say three or four percent that is levied by the National Bank of Serbia, and then another 10 percent is added as a sort of a fine uh, to, for, the, for, the tax, for the taxpayer. So is this on the scope? And if it is not, should it be? Thank you. Straightforward, the answer is yes. It is under the scope of the, of the observatory. As a pr very preliminary remark, it should be said, as you rightly pointed out, that the different difference in nature between uh, interests accrued by the delayed payments and the, the actual fines that they one pers pursues an indemnization for the damage pr produced by the 
use of money. And the other one is actually a prevent, as criminal lawyers would say, preventive repressive measure to punish the individual. That, that difference is paramount in addressing the situation as a non, non busy item violation. Although there might be questions regarding what happens with the difference. What happens when the, the amount of interests exceed the, the mere indemnization? And actually, there are many case law in, in a number of countries. I can think of at least of three or four case law in Latin America pointing out that precisely when it comes to that difference, it might be construed as a violation of non busy need. But this is a very debatable debatable topic. Actually, the, uh, I can think of other five of ten ex examples of this difference not being addressed as a violation of non in Eden, precisely for this difference between indemnization and actual punishment. I agree completely, uh, but just to underline once again, in Serbia at the moment, I believe the default interest is 13% which is not market level. So we do have this difference of 10%, which is not uh, in, of, of indemnitory nat nature. It's more of a sanction for, for the late ma payment made by the taxpayer. Uh, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the ECJ has uh, made a ruling at one point saying that uh, levying both the default interest, which is uh, let's say with this added difference and the pecuniary fine, they, I believe, uh, ruled that this is not in line with, uh, with law, so to speak. Yes, it is. That, that is the case. Although you, you should remember that, uh, as I said, the observatory is uh, impartial. You know, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't actually be, be uh, stating opinions, actually, on what can or what cannot become a, a potential violation of, or, of one of those principles. We actually just uh, devote ourselves to identify what, what the practices on the protection of, the ta of taxpayers' rights are. That, that's pretty much the function of the observatory. Obviously, on, my, on a personal capacity, I have an opinion on that, but it's not my role, it's not the place to, to state it right now. Plus, just to clarify, and before I give Malgorzata Sek the word, it's not actually the market interest level plus 10%. It is, it is the referential interest rate of the National Bank of Serbia. So just to mess things up a little bit, we would have to define the arm's length interest rate, the market one, and then debate, and, and which shows that the question is excellent, that, but, but it, it, it is, as Carlos rightly put, a complex one and can be debated from several sides. Malgorzata, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to, to refer to some words that have been said about uh, Poland and the practice of uh, tax bills uh, being introduced to the parliament by the members of the parliament instead of the government. Uh, it's not that most tax bills are introduced in such a way. It sometimes happens that legislation that has been drafted by the, uh, by the government is then being introduced to the parliament by the members of the parliament and the, um, the difference is that when it's the government drafting and submitting the legislation, there is, um, there is a, con um, a process of consultation at the stage of drafting. So the government has to publish public consultations, has to collect opinions, etc. And if the draft legislation is introduced by the members of the parliament, there is, uh, there is no, uh, no, uh, no obligation to, 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 to publish the consultations, to collect the opinions. However, However, it does not have um, there are no differences regarding the discussion in the parliament. So whenever it's uh, it's the members of the parliament or the government introducing the tax bill, uh, the discussion the proceedings in the parliament are um, are generally similar. So it's only about the consultations at the drafting stage. When members of parliament are drafting, no consultation. When the government is drafting, public consultation is obligatory. So just to, to, to make things clear. We, we will, and I, I presume Romania uh, and Bulgaria had similar issues. I think Romania is the champion of uh, uh, of uh, enacting laws, uh, two laws per day, I think, was was the the was the 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 the, the, the top result. 
Uh, but in Serbia, when you when you rightly put it, only eight percent. It's only eight percent that are actually introduced in regular proceedings. Most of our tax laws are now brought in emergency proceedings, which basically limits the debate to several minutes, and it it really renders the the debate within the. So not only is public consultation effectively missing, or there's a, some sense of it, but nothing meaningful. It is that the parliamentary debate is actually completely void. They, they, it doesn't exist because of the urgency proceedings which are being used, which, which greatly disrupts the quality of laws. And before I, I give Professor Buffon, Buffon the word, it's the uh, I, I would like to, to uh, check whether this idea that Professor Popovich and I were, were discussing and researching of retroactive interpretation. Now, this is something which I think is now uh, 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 starting to become very relevant in the EU, EU as well. And this is what we uh, uh, deem under uh, either the retroactive interpretation or even dormant legislation. So, I'll give you an example. We in Serbia had a big uh, reform drive of tax legislation in 1991. Okay, And at the time, the drafters of the Serbian legislations were very well educated. They were very well up to date with what was going on in the world. So in our legislation, we introduced in 1991 transfer pricing rules. But the first time that these rules were effectively applied in practice was in 2009. Thus, we have rules existing in the tax code for almost two decades before we see their practical application. I'll give you another example, uh, permanent establishment rules that were essentially not applied or they, were, they stood in the legislation as sort of a decoration. We saw that everybody should have it, so we do as well, but we didn't, we didn't read them. And after a while, you realize the potential of the provision and you start aggressively applying it. When, when we talk about retroactive interpretation, it's a situation very similar to what you have now before the ECJ with all the state aid legislation in respect of transfer pricing. It is, uh, so we have transfer pricing people here. You have a rule which was introduced in 1957. That's Article 107, Paragraph 1 of the Treaty of Lisbon is in primary EU legislation since 1957, since the Treaty of Rome. And in 2016, you realize that those rules have a transfer pricing aspect and you say, well, this was always there. Although for 60 years, nobody realized it. And then you start retroactively applying it as if this interpretation existed forever. And I think this is something which is very, very dangerous because it's not classic retroactivity, but it's actually retroactivity in interpretation. And I don't know whether, whether you find similar issues uh, similar issues in, in, in uh, your jurisdiction, but this is something that we have noticed in Serbia now in the EU, EU as well with respect to state aid and transfer pricing cases. Uh, Professor Bufan. Uh, only some uh, few words. In, for the Congress of 2015, I tried to make a Romania report, but the two guys you are talking about, Pasquale and uh, Professor Baker, said they, they are looking for best practices. And uh, after reading the, the draft reports uh, made by the Japan and the Denmark, uh, I, I concluded that I would try to say that Romania has one good procedure or best proce procedure. My colleagues will kill me. Okay, so I think that the idea of, of the observatory is good, but. Uh, uh, here in the region, and I'm sure that uh, the, my affirmation, my, my words are correct, we are in a stage in which the legislation is advancing, but only f in a formal respect, or only formal, not fundamental respect of the taxpayer rights. So the tax administrations are not able and are not willing to implement, or not able to have results and to implement what that is put as a progress in the laws and also this is uh, maybe maybe we could say that is a part of the of the behavior of the taxpayers the the limited uh, degree of voluntary compliance and i think that the observatory should be completed with a, with an east european uh, 
uh, uh, secondary establishment about bad practices. Okay, so now is I think that uh, without an, an input coming from outside, our administrations will never be able to progress. That is an uh, that is an uh, is a, a state of fact, which is difficult to be uh, where, where we don't see progresses. We, we see progresses in enacting new legislation, but we don't see but any I, progress. I will, I will disagree with uh, you to a point, and this uh, is why. Svetislav, I, I want to, uh, you to, to lead this, uh, this, uh, this uh, branch of uh, uh, East European bad and worth practices. But I, 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 I disagree with it. I'm not, I, I, am not, I, I have a different view, and my view is the following. First of all is that we uh, regionally, and I think this is shared a lot, we have a culture of thinking that uh, we have these worst tendencies. Now, while there are some very bad examples, I agree, we can find those in other places as well. That's number one. Secondly, I think that we are not taking into consideration two sides of the equation. Uh, and this is, this is what, and it's very similar to hating the policeman. We all, nobody likes the policeman, but without the policeman, I'm not able to let my child outside to play freely. Now, okay, we dislike the tax administration, which nobody likes to pay taxes. This is, this is normal. But on the other hand, if we want to have a tax administration which, that will have time, resources, and capabilities to discuss with us, to be more uh, cooperative with us, then I think we as taxpayers have to approach our government and say, well, you need to invest more in these institutions. You need to pay our tax inspectors more. You need to equip our tax inspectors better. You need to provide them with the tools that will enable them to actually meet these, these tasks. Uh, I think that we have somehow gotten used to easily complaining about the quality of their work, which often our complaints are just. I am not saying they're not. But on the other hand, we are missing the fact that uh, we have failed to invest in them in order to enable them to meet what we demand of them. And I think this is one of the, 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 the things which our association here uh, can, can be proud of, is that we have for years actually actively approached the government as an association and said it is the firm belief of the Serbian tax profession that the Serbian tax administration is the cornerstone of our environment and that we feel that without investments into it up the other side of the profession has no future. Who is, why should anybody hire us as tax advisors if there's nobody to talk to on the other side? So uh, it is, I think, uh, uh, that uh, uh, it is one of the, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, at least from the Serbian perspective, I can tell you that the Serbian tax administration, over whose practices I often complain, and people who know me know that I'm not sweet-tongued, I, I, I tend to be very aggressive on certain issues, but it's an institution which has managed to do things without any support surprisingly well with constant budget cuts, constant staff cuts, constant without any investment. And if, it's, if there's something at this moment that we, we have to emphasize, it's the need for immediate radical investment. Because without it, uh, there's, well, it's, it, they're gonna come, we're going to get what we deserve. Because if we don't invest, there's nothing we can get, no, not quality. And it's, it's I think, com plain common sense. But on this note, I will, and I've gotten the, the right pronunciation, which I again apologize. So but before, sorry, 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 just I would sure. like to interject sorry. 30 seconds. Yes, yes. Uh, like I said, the observatory is engaged on uh, raising, a, uh, um, raising a awareness on what's going on regarding the practical protection of taxpayers' rights. That involves both good things and not so good things. And maybe those not so good things would improve if we let others know that, that they are actually happening. And then we have a standard to which they can be confronted with. And then, and then maybe by the comparison, there might be a solution might be construed to, to improve what we, what we 
have as wrong on one side, and on the other side, maybe we, by comparison, we can find out that maybe what we thought was pretty bad and was terrible and such, maybe it's not that bad after all. And maybe there are worse practices, and then, and then we see, okay, we're sure we don't want to get there. Uh, but, but at least we have this, this, this is our basis from which we can start improving our procedures and uh, how best to address the, the tax, taxpayers' rights. So I think, and I would, uh, if, you, if I may, I would like to invite you, please, to write that report on the Romanian experience for the observatory in this period of 2018. I, I, I am not speaking, probably I, I must more uh, knowledgeable about Romania, but I'm sure that if we make an effort until tomorrow evening, you have here in the room a report of eight or ten town, uh, countries about the worst national practices. <laughs> this is the, the reality, and I'm wondering how the observator will will progress and will be of any help for us, because now there is not. Yeah, I would I would like to support uh, the professor from from uh, Romania uh, that uh, some uh, worse practices uh, can counteract something which we tick, uh, saying yeah we have this best practice. So for Poland, this example that was given that uh, we have public consultations by law uh, when the government is drafting uh, tax law. Uh, but uh, if you give only 14 days for consulting 200 uh, pages of, of law, is it effective, right? So you ticked, right, we have consultation. Uh, and then uh, if you add uh, this to the list, where you cannot have this worst practice and count it as a best practice, <laughs> Right? Uh, then we we uh, we we are making at least one step forward, uh, uh, supporting professor saying that well, we need to recognize also those uh, those bad practices to improve, right? So uh, so in this way I I, I uh, support and uh, the other part is uh, what what Svetislav uh, said. Uh, it's, it's about awareness and education, what for our taxes, right? Uh, how much money do we spend for tax administration? Uh, whether anybody is analyzing how much do we need uh, for, for a, a good uh, tax administration. But that's another, uh, another point of view. So bad practices against good practices, that's for observatory, for example. And, uh, and education awareness is, uh, is another topic, an investment. I would just uh, suggest the introduction of the third concept, median practice. <laughs> Between worst and best. I think for the reader, median is better than the worst. And, and the best is far away. <laughs> Body color from Hungary. <laughs> This is a bit tricky. <laughs> um, so my, my question is if, um, if it ever makes sense to compare one country to another, because we are all different countries, we come from different backgrounds, and although we have lots of similarities, it's still very difficult to, to say that whatever works for a country, it's going to work for country B. So establishing this bad pra best practice and worst practice thing, I, I don't know if it's, like you can learn from other countries' examples, but I don't really think whatever fits for one country is going to fit for another country. And as far as another thing that we were discussing, uh, <laughs> legislation, like the emergency legislation that Margot Jata uh, said also and, and Svetislav said also, it's, it's happening almost everywhere now. Like the world has become very fast, so, so uh, basically everything has to be done from one day to another. 
And on the other hand, I'm also a bit skeptical about the people who are in the parliament and they are debating the things because are they all tax professors? Do they know about taxation? No, they have a team behind them who is briefing them and they just basically saying what their young team just written down for them. So my, my skeptical view about um, quality legislation is that Legislation is basically not done by the people who are sitting in the parliament. It's done by the people who are sitting behind those people who are sitting in the parliament. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, and I would Sorry. fully agree with you, but not even the people who sit in the parliament, especially in our proportional election systems, but actually at the executive level of the government where the government will table and the parliamentarians will vote as they're told. So, but on this sense, Hrachovinova. Uh, Yes. Perfect. Right. I am almost <laughs> checked. So, Gabriela, I am handing you the floor. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm so sorry uh, for professor from Romania because uh, I brought uh, best practice. Uh, but uh, next time I will uh, bring uh, the bad practice. Uh, I promise you. <laughs> Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you hear me uh, properly. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to express uh, many thanks for organizing uh, this event and uh, bringing us together. I am honored to be here with you in Belgrade. Uh, I could realize today in the morning when I was running through the city that you have here really many parks uh, and I could enjoy it uh, even if uh, it was really cold. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, thank you very much that uh, I could be included among uh, such a distinguished uh, group of speakers. I would like to share with you my practical experience uh, in a pilot project of horizontal monitoring, not in the Czech Republic, uh, which I represent here, but uh, in Austria. I gained uh, this uh, experience at the time when I was working uh, as a managing director and a CFO at company Deichmann. There I was responsible for the Czech and Slovak Republic and simultaneously I was a member of the International Tax Board at the Deichmann CE in Germany. There I supported, among others, uh, the CSEE region in the tax matters. In this slide, uh, you can see a cube. This is not a Rubik's cube, but uh, there is a link between them. The COSO internal control cube can be as daunting uh, as the Rubik's cube. Among others, the horizontal monitoring is very much based on the internal control framework. This framework is widely used by management to enhance uh, an organization's ability to manage uncertainty and consider how much risk to accept as it strives to increase value. That is, that is why I will briefly explain the COSO view. On the top of the cube uh, are the objectives uh, of enterprise risk management. The risk management and the strategy are directly related. On the front of the cube, there are eight components. You have to read it uh, from the top of the cube. On the right side, you see the business structure. The entity level presents the whole organization. It is a task for CFOs to establish a strong internal environment and to check it. The agenda of uh, my presentation consists of three chapters. The first chapter try to answer the question, is the mutual cooperation between the taxpayer and the tax administration possible? The chapter number two describes the methodology, principles and goals of horizontal monitoring and the practical experience from the pilot project horizontal monitoring in Austria. The conclusion creates my last chapter. What is the target of my presentation? You see uh, on the slide at the end of this presentation, you know what the implementation of horizontal monitoring brings in practice. You will see in the text uh, of my presentation some abbreviations. Here is the list of them. 
I personally know that uh, when I go through one week after the presentation, the presentation which I uh, uh, listened, so I hardly can recognize uh, what these abbreviations are, so that's why there is this list. As you can see in the picture, there is a triangle, or more precisely, the compliance pyramid. This pyramid uh, has been invented by Australian Taxation Office. It describes the uh, behavior of taxpayers and shows four segmentations of them. Studies and surveys uh, have shown that majority of taxpayers won't be complied with the law. This attitude represents those taxpayers who are ready, willing, and able to comply are committed to meeting their obligations, have accepted that they have a responsibility to comply, consider that there is a moral or ethical obligation to comply, and regulate their own compliance. They really like to pay taxes, so it is, and for the tax administration it is easy to make. The second group of taxpayers, so-called capture, they try to, but don't always succeed. This attitude uh, represents those taxpayers who don't actively resist the system, often require additional assistance to meet their obligations, try to get things right, but often, through a lack of skills or knowledge, inadvertently get things wrong, and acknowledge that if they cooperate with the tax administration, then the tax administration will try to assist them as much as it can. The third group, the red one of taxpayers, is the group of the resistance. They don't want to comply. This attitude represents those taxpayers who actively resist the self-regulatory system try to avoid meeting their compliance obligations and believe that the tax administration is actively pursuing people to catch them out rather than help them. The last group of taxpayers uh, represent disengagement. They have decided not to comply. This attitude represents these taxpayers who no longer want to participate in the system don't care that they are not doing the right things and will not take any steps to change this situation. There is a unique group of so-called game players who can sit anywhere along the pyramid. This attitude represents these taxpayers who enjoy the challenge of winning against the taxman, don't necessarily think that they are doing the wrong thing, often believe that they are fulfilling their social obligations, often operate within the bounds of the law, and think that they are good citizens. Traditionally, the relationship between taxpayers and tax authorities has been strictly hierarchical and is characterized by retrospective audits and the threat of fines as means to enforce compliance. The behavior of the tax inspectors is based mainly on distrust. Moreover, the tax audit process has been referred to as long-winded and open. The taxpayer usually faces the tax administration. The taxpayer is in the role of a defender, and the tax administration in the role of an aggressor. The command and control paradigm is still the dominant in practice. The cooperation under these circumstances is hardly conceivable. Providing that, that the tax administration don't tar everyone with the same brush, I think uh, that uh, the cooperation between them is possible. In following two slides, I have prepared charts with the expectation of uh, the taxpayers and uh, of the tax administration by the performance of the administration. So, where are the differences? Taxpayer uh, would like to have observance of principle of 
good governance, legal reliance, fairness and objectiveness, fair-minded rating of uh, taxpayers, and adequacy from the side of tax administration. What would like to have uh, the tax administration? So showing taxes in the correct amount, performance of duties in time, observance of laws, fairness, and responsibility. I try to find some joint expectations of both sides, and uh, I think I found them. This is proficiency, proactive cooperation on partnership basis, mutual confidence, openness, transparency, and timelines. This is the slide uh, when I would like to show you a picture. This uh, picture was, uh, was used in the Netherlands by presenting and introducing of horizontal monitoring. I don't want to bother you, but uh, I don't know if uh, you know or if you are aware about the uh, project horizontal monitoring. But uh, if you don't mind, I uh, will shortly go throughout these slides. We are uh, at the chapter number two, and there are me there are methodology principle principles and goals of horizontal monitoring. Horizontal monitoring uh, as itself was introduced in studies of uh, OECD concerning themes about tax compliance and uh, enhanced relationship. It was in year 2001 and 2005. The tax administration develops in horizontal monitoring the concept of cooperation between very large business taxpayer participating in horizontal monitoring in a relationship based on trust. The idea of good governance support that delegates from business, advisory, companies, and academics in this project take part in. There are examples of states uh, which implemented uh, horizontal monitoring. There is, for instance, Australia, Denmark, Finland, Spain, the Netherlands, it was the first country in the euro. And what I know, uh, also Croatia should uh, implement horizontal monitoring. There are principles. What needs horizontal monitoring? Definitely positive climate based on mutual confidence, openness and transparency. The targeted group for horizontal monitoring are very large business taxpayers who are willing to act honestly in tax matters. The disclosure and transparency ensure that the tax administration for very large business taxpayers has the continuous overview concerning taxpayers' internal control system and their consequences. Principles. The tax administration will not repeat the control measure provided by other control bodies, uh, for example, audit, internal revision, or risk management. There is a picture or onion skin model uh, where you can see how it, is, uh, it, how it is realized in the practice. The tax administration has qualified the horizontalization of supervision as the adoption of fundamentally new approach. The term paradigm change refers to a new, reform, new form of supervision from exposed, which is committed to history, on the contrary to the continuous supervision, which is oriented to present. Goals of horizontal monitoring for taxpayers. It is the reliance on law and the certainty to plane, the cost reduction on the observance of rules. Goals for tax administration, this is the support in tax compliance, the assuring of paying taxes in time and correctly, the explanation and the preparative work for advance ruling, and Tax administration will focus on taxpayers who are at risk of failing to comply, 
with the statutory regulations or failing to pay their tax in medium term plan. Within the Dijkman Group uh, was horizontal monitoring implemented uh, in the Netherlands at company Van Harn Shoes. In the Netherlands was uh, firstly implemented the horizontal monitoring project uh, for very large business taxpayers. And uh, our company uh, Van Harn Shoes uh, was in the second round, which uh, was focused on uh, medium size uh, enterprises. So our company started with horizontal monitoring in 2009. Uh, there were taxes included uh, as uh, corporate income tax, personal income tax, value added tax. There was signed a special agreement uh, between the tax uh, administration and uh, our company Van Harn Shoes. I could hear only positive information from my colleagues from the Netherlands that were, that, that, that were really satisfied with this horizontal monitoring project. Uh, and what I know, the Netherlands uh, ha hasn't embedded uh, the horizontal monitoring into the law yet. Maybe yes, but I, I'm not aware of it. The Netherlands uh, had been followed uh, by Austria, by company Dijkman Schuetter Vertriebsgesellschaft GmbH, respectively, in 2013. Taxes involved in this project uh, were same taxes uh, uh, as uh, in the Netherlands. There wasn't no agreement which was signed between the tax authority and the Austrian Austrian subsidiary. Uh, there was a special. There was there, there was a signed a special memoranda. Uh, what I know, uh, my colleagues were really satisfied with this project. And uh, at that time, the horizontal monitoring hasn't been, uh, wasn't embedded into the law. But under the draft bill effective of the January 1st, uh, 2019, horizontal monitoring would be established uh, as an alternative to tax audits for larger corporations and corporate groups that satisfy certain requirements. To participate in horizontal monitoring, an application would have to be filed by the top Austrian company for some or related companies resident in Austria provided certain conditions. For instance, at least one of the group companies has revenue higher than 40 million euro during the preceding two years. No fiscal penalties were assessed during the last five years. There has been confirmation by an auditor regarding the implementation of a tax control system. The tax administration would verify that these conditions are satisfied. As you see, the German colleagues uh, tried to prefer also start of horizontal monitoring 2014, even if uh, they had a that time, timely audits. I was in charge to try to persuade with materials, facts, and arguments the Czech tax administration that the pilot project, the horizontal monitoring for very large business taxpayer makes sense. I wasn't successful. Last year, uh, I heard at a conference that the Czech tax administration would like to start uh, this cooperative compliance for medium and small enterprises, even if these are the very large business taxpayers which are paying taxes in essentially bigger amounts than medium and small enterprises. And moreover, and this is only my opinion and practical experience, these medium and small enterprises doesn't have or usually don't use control, uh, tax, uh, uh, tax control framework. So I can't believe, uh, but uh, so it is. 
Horizontal monitoring was uh, introduced uh, as a pilot project embedded uh, in the Fair Play initiative launched by Austrian Ministry of Finance in July 2011. In cooperative compliance programs such as horizontal monitoring, the strict vertical relationship between taxpayers and tax administrations is a challenge. Instead, cooperation at the eye level and the adherence to fair rules are expected to bear advantages for both taxpayers and tax administration. The move from vertical, vertical to horizontal monitoring is expected to promote mutual trust and cooperation by means of commercial awareness, impartiality, proportionality, and responsiveness by the tax administration on the one side and disclosure and transparency by taxpayers on the other side. In the Austrian horizontal monitoring project, only enterprises failing under the responsibility of the large business auditing unit could apply, had implemented a tax control framework, and had to demonstrate a reliable tax strategy in the past. The tax control framework permits the administration to trust enterprises and to allow a simplification of tax duties. The, the Austrian Horizontal Monitoring Project was discussed uh, in May 2012 uh, at Teichmann internally. The informal meeting uh, with the tax administration a so-called Großbetriebsprüfung took place in December 2012. During this meeting, the internal control system of Deichmann was introduced and the company voiced its interest to participate in horizontal monitoring. The first meeting took place uh, on January 17, 2013. There was discussed the internal control system the entire tax audit of the previous years, 2010 to 2012, was scheduled and the contact person were determined. <coughs> the entire tax audit started on March 25, 2013. The tax auditors spent five days in company. All tax issues are disclosed, uh, for example, employees' voucher and their impact on VAT in the meeting on my 7th, 2013. The second meeting uh, took place on September 25th, 2013. We are still in year 2013. It was the closing discussion where the results from tax audit were presented and the tax administration expressed the status quo to the internal control system. The tax audit lasted five months without significant findings. Since 2012, the company doesn't bear any tax risk. The good atmosphere dominated during the tax audit, even if the tax uh, inspector has broken uh, <coughs> her leg, <coughs> but uh, still uh, they, 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 they were on time. The tax inspector was well-educated, shipshape, and reliable. The third meeting took place on December 11th, 2013. The memorandum of participation on the pilot project horizontal monitoring was signed, accompanied by tasty coffee and delicious cookies. From a legal perspective, the relationship between the company and the tax administrative remained largely unchanged. The fourth meeting was held on February 18, 2014. There were discussed some practical issues and decided that, for example, it's not necessary to check again each receipt which has been booked in each shop. The corporate income tax return for 2013 was submitted and hand over to the tax administration on February 19, 2014. The tax administration replied what is needed uh, the next day. It means on February 20, 2014. 
the tax administration confirmed that everything in the corporate tax return for 2013 is okay on July 31st, 2014. The tax administration wrote and continuously amended a handbook concerning the horizontal monitoring project. This living paper helped the taxpayers understand the development and the changes in the project. Horizontal monitoring is an efficient tool and an amendment of the traditional tax audit. Horizontal monitoring itself cannot replace the traditional audit. Uh, there was an evaluation report which said this sentences. The length of the pilot project of uh, horizontal monitoring you can see so on this slide it took uh, from 2011 to 2016. The results of the pilot project horizontal monitoring in Austria. Uh, very large business taxpayers uh, among them uh, were Egger, Shell, Deichmann, Red Bull, Hornbach, uh, it consisted of various national and international corporate structures and a wide range of business activities, including energy, technology, building, materials, logistics, food, drinks, and shoes, as a company Dijkman is. As you can see, the meeting for the future, which took place in 2017, concluded. Horizontal monitoring is a close, as a close cooperation between the taxpayer and tax uh, administration is beneficial for both sides and offers legal security and planning reli reliability for the taxpayer as well as timely and compliant collection of duties for the tax administration. There was, a more, there was a special study which has <coughs> investigated how horizontal monitoring is a new paradigm in tax administration, is pursued by different stakeholder group, sh and shows the uh, following result. Horizontal monitoring is pursued significantly more positively by tax officials involved in horizontal monitoring. Horizontal monitoring is also persuaded as highly positive by employees of companies involved in the horizontal monitoring pilot project. Tax officials inexperienced <coughs> in horizontal monitoring remained considerably more skeptical. It may be difficult for many tax officials to change the prevailing mindset in a new one. In order to increase acceptance of horizontal monitoring and the willingness to trust and corporate, tax administration staff and company employees need to be fully informed about the project, its goals, and its implementation steps. Information must be provided not only to employees directly involved in horizontal monitoring, but also to stakeholders outside the project in order to promote the challenging paradigm shift toward cooperative relationship. This pilot project in Austria was based on the Dutch model of cooperative compliance. As I have mentioned before, after the pilot phase, uh, the Austrian Ministry of Finance is now preparing uh, for the long-term implementation of horizontal monitoring. The cooperation based on the mutual confidence is the highest form of people's motivation. The point is to find a way how to motivate the taxpayers for paying tax enthusiastically. And, and to, to, enthusiastically. Uh, I'm personally, uh, I'm a little bit skeptical because BECs may influence uh, the tax inspectors to hold tougher audits. It may destroy the trust developed by horizontal monitoring. We cannot exclude that uh, somebody will come and uh, can speak about possible state aid issues uh, which can cause horizontal monitoring. Hopefully not. 
horizontal monitoring as a cooperative compliance cre creates an opposite side to the mandatory disclosure rule, is voluntary, transparent, and goes beyond the obligation. The relevant tax administration should, in return, provide certainty regarding a tax position in advance. It might be the right way to combat aggressive tax planning. Thank you, Gabriella, for this excellent insight into the details of the horizontal monitoring process. Uh, do we have any questions at this moment? I, I would just add for Poland that we, uh, we are working on a pilot program of uh, uh, horizontal monitoring also, and uh, uh, that uh, the main problem I see for the success of this program is uh, is this hindsight interpretation you mentioned before, so that we have this post-BEPS mindset now, uh, and we are uh, applying this retroactively. So I mean, the administration wants to. Uh, and this is something that, uh, uh, stays between trust uh, and uh, enthusiasm, right? Uh, that 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 taxpayers need to believe uh, uh, into um, goodwill from the side of of the tax administration. Another um, another barrier I, I see is business understanding on the side of the tax administration. Otherwise, I would be also enthusiastic about this program. Thank you. Okay. Uh, should we switch seats? Yes. So we, now we're going to hear the experiences of an actual pilot project. I will switch slides that we have in our neighboring jurisdiction of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Dan, please. Thanks again to Serbian Fiscal Society for this kind invitation. Uh, it is a great opportunity to share some thoughts about this very interesting topic and uh, I won't be answering on the question is mutual uh, cooperation possible between tax administration and the tax very taxpayer because Gabriela already answered to this question and also I will uh, support her conclusions uh, with her presentation. I will rather uh, discuss with you about some uh, specific methodology that we developed within Bosnia and Herzegovina and within uh, institution uh, that I worked for and that's indirect taxation authority of Bosnia and Herzegovina. At the beginning I will say that we have started with the pilot project of horizontal monitoring it in 2014 and after four years of implementing the pilot project, we are now in the final phase of draft, drafting the legislation. <laughs> so today uh, it is basically the first time that we present in public uh, the results of, of our uh, very specific model of auditing. So that's also a great pleasure for us. And for us as well. <laughs> Thank you. At the beginning, uh, uh, the definition uh, that we come to is basically that horizontal monitoring is a preventive measure of the tax supervision with the aim that uh, the tax administration can rely on voluntary compliance of obligations for indirect taxes and uh, the administration provides to the large taxpayer of indirect taxes a tax certainty in respect to his tax position which he possesses and reduces administrative burden in terms of tax supervision. Uh, from the point of view of the tax administration, it should also be uh, interpreted uh, as a level of uh, adjustment of the tax supervision within the very large taxpayer which is in the in the special agreement uh, so uh, fundamental principles it's basically uh, we prescribe two fundamental principles principle of voluntary fulfillment of indirect tax taxes obligations and uh, the principle of reducing the administrative burden of tax su supervision uh, when we want to make it a little simpler let's say like that uh, we would say like it's a circle, 
within five uh, specific pillars. Uh, uh, basically, uh, it's a basis on uh, transparency between tax administration and taxpayers. It's uh, to have a, a, a understanding, mutual understanding relating to the taxes that, that are implied. Also mutual trust in terms uh, between uh, taxpayer and, and uh, tax administration and uh, understanding good, uh, uh, and acting in good faith. Uh, with the fifth uh, pillar, voluntary fulfillment, it means that uh, basically uh, the, it is considered like, a, like the willingness of the large taxpayers of, of indirect taxes to legally, certainly and timely fulfill the obligations for indirect taxes. <coughs> and also the capability of the large taxpayer to implement and ensure the quali quality of the tax control framework management system for taxes and that such established system, system is being constantly improved. Uh, we developed four uh, different phases uh, within the process of horizontal monitoring and this is procedure for granting of applicant status procedure of an assessment of enforceability of horizontal monitoring, procedure of the conclusion and uh, application of the horizontal monitoring agreement, and supervision over the enforceability of the agreement on horizontal monitoring. Uh, the first phase, uh, which is basically procedure for granting applic applicant status, uh, also divides like through uh, like a three different steps. The first step is submitting a request for an assessment of the enforceability of horizontal monitoring. Second one is reviewing uh, requirements for assessing. And the third one is decision on the status of, of the applicant. Uh, on this slide, you can see like uh, the main requirements for status of an ap applicant. Uh, you will see it's six, uh, six different requirements that we ask for from the very taxpayer. Uh, to have uh, its headquarters in the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, the authorized person of the taxpayer or member or members <coughs> of, the, of the boards of the very taxpayers have not been convicted for the, any criminal offense. That's the second one. The third one, that the taxpayers should have three positive audit reports in over the past three years. The fourth one is basically that the taxpayers uh, has been developed the internal control mechanism mechanisms, which means that the uh, tax control framework management system should be in place. The fourth one is basically that uh, the very same applicant uh, should be fulfilled all, all conditions for the concluding of the horizontal monitoring. Uh, and the last one is that uh, taxpayers should not be in any appeal procedure uh, or dispute against the tax administration. Procedure of assessing uh, the enforceability of horizontal monitoring also take like six different steps, uh, which basically are going simultaneously. Continuous monitoring, creating the tax profile, assessment of the tax control framework, the interview with the applicant, and the very last one is preparation for the horizontal monitoring agreement conclusion. Uh, continuous monitoring is basically one of the steps which we are doing the most during the piloting of the project. Uh, throughout the establishment of the electronic exchange of the information with the taxpayers who, who be or like part of the pilot project, uh, results of that kind of uh, established exchange and also processing the data that, uh, that uh, the taxpayers submitting to, to, to the tax administration should be like a bridge or platform to build mutual trust and understanding between, between tax administration and the taxpayer. 
The tax uh, applicant's profile allows uh, administration to estimate some expectations that the applicant will fulfill the obligations of taxes during the validity of the horizontal monitoring agreement. And uh, we come to the third one, which is much more interesting than the, any other from the, from the previous slide. Uh, and this is the assessment of the tax control framework. Uh, you will see like we have like six building blocks uh, we, which we are assessing throughout this stage. The first one is uh, documenting of the tax strategy. Uh, taxpayer should be uh, should, has adopted, uh, should be in, in place to, to present to us that he has adopted the tax strategy and he has also uh, clearly documented that, that tax strategy. Uh, tax strategy should reflect at least uh, tax, tax uh, risk strategy, risk appetite, also uh, reporting, payment, uh, filing, and also uh, he needs to provide us uh, with the proof that the information technology is being used in order to, to raise the quality of the data and information that, is, that are basis, basis for the very fulfillment of the tax returns. The second one, uh, compressive application of the tax uh, strategy. That basically means that uh, taxpayers has adopted a process-oriented approach in terms of using tax control framework. The third one, uh, distribution of uh, responsibilities, that practically means uh, that all the roles and responsibility are allocated uh, in a way that, uh, uh, that the persons with the skills and, and uh, relevant experience are uh, responsible for the, for, the, uh, for the tax strategy and also uh, the fourth one is the documentation uh, of the indirect taxation, which, mean, which means basically that uh, the taxpayers has reconciled the tax con control framework with its strategy and, uh, and, the and, and its very business. Testing efficiency means that uh, taxpayers uh, has a possibility to timely uh, detect any ir irregularity and also to remove that ir ir irregularities and, and uh, not repeat them. And the control, uh, that's the last building block, basically it reflects uh, the five previous ones. Within the phase of the interview with the applicant, uh, the objectives are that assessment of the justification and the purposefulness of uh, concluding horizontal monitoring agreement, getting to know the applicants and the administration's expectations in relation to further assessment of the enforceability, as well uh, as eliminating eventual irregularities and the uh, defenses identified during the implementation of phases, uh, phases in the procedure of assessing enforceability. The whole period of assessing uh, of uh, enforceability of horizontal monitoring could be uh, from 60 days to 12 months with the possibility to postpone uh, the end of that phase with six, within the six months. After the completion uh, of the assessment procedure, basically we can say that the whole procedure can be successful or unsuccessful, and based on that decision, if, uh, if the applicant is successful, then uh, we, are, we, may, we make a proposal for conclusion of the horizontal monitoring. Uh, the, very same text of, of the of the of the uh, of the agreement basically reflects all the principles that I explained throughout this this uh, presentation. Uh, in this last fa phase of drafting the guidelines for the horizontal monitoring in Bosnia and Herzegovina, temporarily we are at the discussion how the supervision over the application of the agreement uh, will look like. Uh, basically, I would say that uh, 
based on the best or bad practices you said throughout this, this session today, uh, this is more or less something that bothers uh, most of the countries that are implementing the very the same concept. So uh, we are on the trace uh, probably uh, to make some kind of system that uh, the taxpayers uh, uh, should submit at least once a year annual audit plan and report on that audit. And from the, uh, for the other side, from the side of the tax administration, uh, we will revise the implementation of the agreement at least once in a period of five years. But the level of the audit uh, will be decided uh, in accordance with the mark of the assessing of the tax control framework. For instance, if the average uh, percentage of the tax control frameworks uh, will be like 4.5 or 5, which is the best mark, then in that case, in that case uh, we will just uh, do an audit uh, based on sample like 5% of, of the overall documentation uh, will be supervised. So uh, also the number of agreements for the first phase, uh, uh, bearing in mind that the guidance uh, will take uh, in force from the 1st of January of 2019 until the end of the year 2020, uh, we will conclude 40 agreements mm -hmm. divided uh, related to the authorities of the very regional centers. So in case you have any more questions for me, uh, I will give you my details on the last uh, slide so you can also contact me. And that's it for today. Thank you so much. Okay. Can I just have a, a short question? Uh, uh, how would you uh, encourage uh, taxpayers to enter the, the cooperation? So what are the benefits for them? So uh, benefits are basically, uh, we are the institution that are responsible only for the indirect taxes. So customs, uh, VAT and excise duties. So more, the ben more benefits will be on the territory of the VAT. In terms that, uh, for instance, if you have like a legal period for tax refund, for instance, 30 or 60 days, then all those taxpayers uh, will get the refund first day of, of, of the, in accordance with the legislation. So improvement also, of cash flow. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's that's one point. Uh, yeah. Is that not, is this enough? No, this is not enough. But also uh, the level of the supervision will not so tough like like it is. So basically, the, the, the supervision of the audit will not be the same like in the past. For We are doing uh, the audits, like retrospective audits, but uh, for the case of the taxpayers uh, I within this program, this is not the retrospective audits. We, we, it will be much more like working on preventive uh, measures. For instance, uh, we will discuss uh, with open questions uh, with the taxpayers uh, timely, no. Timely. Yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, that's a uh, good encouragement. And uh, what about criminal responsibility? This sort of uh, do, do uh, you we have? We have the certain provisions in the guidance uh, related to termination of the agreement. So, in case that uh, something shows up on the terms of the criminal offences, uh, immediately the agreement will be terminated. So, so, so the responsibility is not excluded when you're within the agreement. Yeah. Is yeah. not. No. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I have one, one question, which is something which is coming up in the Netherlands right now. And that is uh, uh, actually a complaint by medium, small size enterprises and by individual taxpayers that horizontal monitoring drives have actually uh, been overly focused on a large tax, corporate taxpayers. And that the investment that's been done into horizontal monitoring uh, was done uh, at a cost of basically denying the small taxpayer the con everyday contact with the tax inspector. So, for example, what they would say is that it is the, the large taxpayers, which through horizontal monitoring would get, um, uh, you know, first-hand experience with the tax inspector. They would have the agreement. They would have this, uh, these discussions. But for everybody else, we go into the digital transformation where 
the phone of the tax inspector of the tax office is no longer available and there is no contact anymore. And this is something that I uh, maybe we could we should also also take into consideration that uh, it is um, uh, this over focus maybe is something that that should be that we should be careful with. And I think that that when you say what are the 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 pos the benefits the positive aspects it's actually this this trust this belief that if I'm in this close relationship then bad things will not happen. Actually, I don't think that even in the U.S. or in the Netherlands you get anything any surety it's just that I've told you everything you tell me everything and now we're in love and that's that's the basis I don't think you you get get any surety from especially not from criminal liability well I uh, I'm asking in the context of, of uh, um, expectations of Polish taxpayers when uh, when this uh, pilot program uh, is being discussed uh, these are the expectations we we have this criminal uh, fiscal code uh, in Poland, uh, which is uh, rather unusual for Europe. Uh, so, uh, personal responsibility of accountant, of uh, uh, chief financial officer uh, for in compliance, and uh, uh, the issue is how it is applied. Uh, so, it should be uh, when there is uh, 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 when someone is. Uh, uh, responsible by um, negligence, right? Uh, and and in practice, it's applied uh, like automatically by the tax officer. So this is uh, this is what generates uh, untrust. And how mm. successful is this? But this is probably more yeah, for, for, for Dominic. <laughs> how successful are the because we we also think that that uh, the bringing of criminal charges is over is done too liberally and that not enough thought is is actually put into the process of just seeing whether there's you know reason enough for doing this mm -hmm. and then uh, we have a lot of criminal offense charges brought up pretty much two or three percent are successful 97 percent fail in front of courts because they're just not substantiated there is no crime well as a tax advisor i i, I haven't lost a case criminal uh, mm, against against a client but it's also a matter of uh, of uh, uh, negotiating with a taxpayer I, I I charge you with this give me something uh, you know this, this sort of uh, uh, talk. it's uh, totally unofficial so uh, it's not going to be YouTubed okay <laughs> I'm not agreeing to that but uh, but uh, basically uh, I I got lost what for is this criminal uh, fiscal code based on the cases I, I'm facing I would, I would fully agree with you because I think that with criminal charges we have the sort of our experience is very similar and it's sort of past the ball game so you have uh, the first level tax inspector saying, well, you know, I'll, con I'll you know, co inform the tax police because if I don't, then somebody will suspect me of being too negligent. Mm -hmm. The tax police says, well, I'll submit criminal charges, let the prosecutor deal with it. Yeah. And then the prosecutor will say, well, you know, uh, I'll press the charges and then the courts will say whatever they want to say because I don't want to be seen as negligent. Now, in the end, 95% of cases, I think that's the last analysis of criminal charges brought against experts fail in court, mm -hmm. right? They're, 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 they're dismissed. But the moment this is made public, and often this is done, that criminal charges have been brought up, there is an immediate negative effect. And it's actually, uh, again, the censorship potential of the criminal charge, because when I bring criminal charges against you, I make your life a misery, and this will discipline you, even though there might not be any conclusion of the criminal charge itself. Mm -hmm. So I think this would be an exceptionally positive thing in saying that if I've presented everything mm -hmm. to you that you have requested in this procedure, then it would be an adequate quid pro quo for you to be denied the right to submit criminal charges where I have uh, behaved uh, positively and I've informed you of everything because what's my, where's the intent then? And for a criminal charge, you need to have an intent of doing a criminal act. Exactly. There, there is also another aspect of uh, cooperative compliance, which is creating a tax control framework, which means I, uh, as a CFO, I'm establishing within the, the company procedures so that uh, I can deal with the risk that 
tax risk uh, embedded in the organi organization. So I'm actively acting against realize, materializing of those, uh, of those tax risks. So where is my fault? Uh, even if uh, if those risk uh, risks materialize, so uh, basically because of this mistrust between uh, tax uh, uh, taxpayers and uh, tax uh, administration, uh, uh, where the latter was overusing uh, the uh, uh, criminal fiscal uh, fiscal code, uh, the. Uh, expectation of the taxpayers in Poland for the pilot program is to uh, take the criminal fiscal code off the table, off the table as a starting point to building trust. Gabriela Hrachkolnikova would like to say something. I would like to ask you, Dejan, um, uh, which taxpayers uh, were, uh, were um, collaborated on uh, horizontal monitoring uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Uh, the 12 largest taxpayers within the regional office of Banja Luka, 12 largest, all on vol voluntary basis. Mm -hmm. Yes, we decided to, to take like 12, 12 taxpayers and we offered them to sign the letter on intentions to, intention to be part of the pilot project and they all agreed. And the second question is um, uh, how many tax inspectors uh, do you have uh, for horizontal monitoring because in Austria we have only one inspector and she knew uh, everything about Teichmann. Uh, I usually in the Czech and Slovak Republic uh, has a, had a practical experience. The tax inspectors uh, came to us and asked me, uh, Mrs. Rakovinova, uh, your uh, parent company is sitting in Vienna and I told them please read the commercial register and check who is our owner. You know, it costs time, uh, it costs energy, and they came to us and they weren't ready to, to do a tax inspection. So uh, can you explain me At how does it work yeah. uh, in, uh, in Bosnia and we Herzegovina? We assigned each taxpayer with one team of auditors, mm -hmm. which basically consists of two, two auditors. And uh, each team monitored uh, the taxpayers like for the period of four years mm -hmm. until the end. Mm -hmm. So that was like from the same, very same beginning. Mm -hmm. So basically they, they familiarized with, with the taxpayers from the beginning and learn about its business, about its tax control framework, about its uh, internal uh, control mechanisms, etc. But of course, uh, uh, it raised the question of corruption then, because uh, yes, uh, is it like reliable to, to, to take one, one pair, one, one, one team to follow like for the period of the four years? But when you when you take uh, into considera uh, consideration the prax practice of other countries, then you will find that all of them uh, like do the same practice. Like three to five years, they are not changing the team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we go now to Dominic. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Let me just put up Dominic's presentation. And finally, we have Dominic with the protection of taxpayers' rights in Poland with the achievements and threats before us. Thank you, please. Okay, thank you very much. And let me first thank the organizers for inviting me here, for giving me the opportunity to speak here, to speak to such a great audience, and, uh, and uh, for giving me the opportunity to visit such a beautiful country and beautiful a uh, beautiful town, uh, thank you very much, because I'm for the first time here in this part of Europe, so I'm pleased with that. And uh, additionally, I must say I know that I'm not in the most comfortable situation because I'm the last speaker and I know the longer I will speak, uh, the later we will finish. So the situation is not perfect, but I will try to speak shortly and I will try to focus on, in my opinion, the most important, uh, the most important issue. Some of them were mentioned by Professor Waffe, some of them were mentioned by Svetislav Kostic, and uh, m maybe I will refer to them uh, later on. So, uh, first of all, I will 
uh, I will try to start with, not typically, with the conclusion. With the conclusion, so I will say that uh, the system of protection of taxpayers' rights in Poland is formally very good. So we had, I think, the all the instruments that are needed to protect taxpayer rights. But the substa substantially, when you look at the system, there are some places when we can think it could be it could be better, and we could improve some. Sorry, some uh, some elements. I think we can. Uh, uh, we can consider the system into four dimensions. First, constitutional provisions that help to protect uh, taxpayers' rights. Then, judicial, uh, ju judicial protection, which is... Okay. Okay. So maybe I will move a little bit. Sorry. No, it is okay. It is okay. It's working. Yeah, like from over there. This one? Yeah, I, I suggested it here. Okay. <laughs> it will be easier because maybe. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. It's better? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So, four dimensions. We can group all those instruments into, in, into four groups and facts, so constitutional provisions, judicial protection, which is, in my opinion, very important, maybe because I'm sitting in the middle of it, and uh, procedural principles. I think they are common for uh, many European countries, so I will not focus on this part of my presentation. And other, others, uh, other means, uh, most of them are substantial, substantial law, but uh, some of them are also procedural. First, I would like to focus uh, for a moment on consti constitutional provisions. I think there are three, the most important uh, articles of Polish constitution. First, Article 8.1, stating that the constitution is supreme law of the Republic of Poland. This is, of course, the base for, uh, uh, for passing the tax law. And uh, all acts passed by parliament and no laws issued by other organs should be compliant with the constitution. It's, it's obvious. But in Article 84 we have another rule strictly referring to taxation. Everyone should comply uh, with his responsibilities and public duties, uh, including the payment of taxes as specified by statutes. In my opinion this is very important because this a short provision, in fact, includes two very important rules. First, the rule of uh, commonness of tax obligations, so everyone should pay uh, taxes. And the other rule, everyone should pay taxes, but only on one condition, when the taxes are specified by statute. And the statute is very important because the statute, in, in the light of this article, is the, only, is the only source of Polish tax law, in fact. So passing the law can be uh, the law can be passed only in the parliament. And the, the longest constitutional provision referring to tax law is Article 217. Article quite long, but the wording of the article is quite important. The imposition of taxes, as well as other public imposts, I mean, other public duties should m m maybe will be better, the specification of those subject to tax and rates of taxation, as well as principles for granting tax reliefs and remissions, along with categories of taxpayers exempted from taxation, shall be by means of status. So very long provision, but saying, in fact, that all elements of tax construction should be specified by means of status. And now we can ask a question whether the Constitution gives us a principle of stability of tax law. Generally, we can say, yes, it is, because only a statute can be a source of tax law. But on the other hand, we have mentioned before that we have some problems with passing the law, and I can give you two examples. For example, first example was the problem of public consultation. On one hand, we have obligatory public consultation, always when the draft is prepared by government. But two problems connected with this. First problem is that the consultation is uh, very often very formal. Just having the opinion of, 
of, of different parties, but the opinion are not taken into account when the law is passed by parliament. So this is the first problem. And another problem is even maybe more, the, more important because it is connected with a very easy way of uh, avoiding the consultation by avoiding the process of passing law. For example, when a government submits the draft to, to the parliament, the consultation is obligatory. But when the uh, draft is uh, submitted by a member of parliament, there is no consultation at all. So a government can change the way the law is passed, can directly submit the law to the parliament, the draft to the parliament, of course, having the obligatory consultation, or can avoid this path and to, uh, can choose the faster path of passing the law, giving the prepared in the same room, prepared in the same room, a draft of the tax law, giving the, the tax law to the member of the parliament, and the member of the parliament submits the law and without consultation can be passed by parliament. And this is the first problem. And uh, our tax system was built in the beginning of 90s. It is connected, of course, with, uh, with, 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 the, with the history and with, with the changing of uh, changes that happened in the, in, in, in the beginning of 90s. And now we have tax laws that, uh, that are in force for 20 even more years. But there are some laws that have been amended for more than 100 times. And there is a question whether we still can say about the stability of tax law when there is one act of law is being changed for 100 times, which is, uh, which is not a very rare situation. So, on the one hand, we have a situation that we have the highest possible level of passing the tax law, only by parliament, only by the mean of statute. But on the other hand, it is instrumentally sometimes used to have a very fast law passed by parliament, but formally by parliament, but without consultations, without this, uh, this typical way that the, the draft should, should come before it is passed. So, What about judicial protection? Again, I would like to come to the Constitution and uh, focus on two articles, Article uh, 175.1 of the Constitution of Republic of Poland and Article 184 of the Constitution. The first of the provision states that administrat the administration of justice in the Republic of Poland shall be implemented by Supreme Court it doesn't deal with uh, tax cases. The common courts, of course, doesn't deal with tax cases. Administrative courts, this is the courts that control tax administration, and military courts that are not important here uh, in the case. And with us, in Article uh, 184, the Supreme Administrative Court, this one Supreme Administrative Court in Warsaw, another administrative court, we have 16 regional courts of justice, shall exercise to the extent specified, of course, by statute, control or supervision over the performance of public administration. So the system is uh, shaped in the provision of, uh, of the Constitution. And, but still we have administrative courts, so general administrative court. We don't have spe specialized tax court or even financial court. So, there is a question how good the courts are. In my opinion, the quality of uh, judiciary in Poland is quite high, so because it's, uh, the administrative court of justice are created by uh, different kinds of uh, candidates. For example, a judge in the administrative court can be a professor, so academics can be judges from common courts, but can be also a practitioners who are dealing with tax cases. So we have a mixture of different people inside the administrative courts, but we still don't have a specialized chambers on the first instance of judiciary because the Supreme Administrative Court is, uh, consists of three chambers. The first chamber is, oh, maybe not the first, but one of them is financial chambers. The chamber is divided into two departments. The first department deals with VAT and the second department deals with other taxes. So judges, uh, judges are judging in these chambers are spe specialized in taxes, not in taxes 
uh, in whole, but specialize in this special kind of taxes. So we can say they are really good experts uh, in the area. But a step uh, uh, in the first step, we have just uh, courts. They are not specialized at all. So there are 16 administrative courts, and judges are not uh, are not uh, specialized in the field of taxation. So. We have 16 courts, and for example, it depends on, 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 on the courts. But in my court, there are four departments, and the first, first department of the court is uh, so-called financial department, so we deal with only tax matters. But it is decision still of the president of the court, because one day I can be a judge uh, dealing with tax cases, and the other, uh, the other day I can judge with, for example, building cases or, or environmental cases, all that is inside the uh, administrative, uh, administrative law. And what is the role, in my opinion, of the administrative courts in Poland? I think we, should, uh, we, could, we, we can say about two functions. First is preventive function, preventive meaning of the administrative courts of justice, and the, and, and the second one is individual function. Preventive function means that uh, existence of administrative courts limiting the tax administration's aspiration and imposing tax obligation contrary to the statute. I believe that uh, tax administration always should keep, should keep in mind that there is something over the administration that, that can control the decision, that can control the administration. Uh, of course, the control is enacted on the request of taxpayer. It doesn't work ex officio. And the individual meaning, when a taxpayer asks a court, so submitted a, uh, a complaint against the decision, and then, of course, the administrative court controls the decision, but cannot change the decision, can only set aside the decision when it's wrong, or can uh, repeal the decision, but cannot change it, which is a little bit, uh, maybe in some cases, a little bit, uh, a little bit strange. And what are, in my opinion, the most important principles work out by the administrative courts? Uh, the first uh, uh, very important principle was, uh, that was uh, uh, emphasized in the judiciary of administrative courts is principle of uh, judging or, or settling in favor of uh, taxpayers, so-called in Latin, in dubia pro tributario. For many years, we didn't have such a provision in Polish tax law, so in Polish tax ordinance, in Polish general uh, code, in, in Polish general co uh, tax code, we didn't have the, the, the provision. But in the in many judgment, in many judgment, Polish administrative court said there is something like a principle of settling. Uh, debts in favor of taxpayers. So if there are some debts, they should be settled in favor of taxpayer. And what can be re really strange, we finally introduced this, uh, this provision to Polish tax, tax code uh, as of uh, 1st January 2016, but the wording of this article is uh, not perfect. And there is a question. Well, there's a question whether the introducing this uh, principle to the tax code improved a position of taxpayer, but quite quite opposite. The position of taxpayer was uh, was in fact ruined ruined by, by, by this article because the wording uh, the wording is not perfect. If I have time, I will tell about it a little bit uh, a little bit later. Another principle that was uh, worked out in the by the administrative courts, this, uh, administrative courts try to extend the limits of cognition. And I can give you one example of this. In, under Polish tax law, we had a very strange situation. Uh, because uh, depending on, uh, on, on the proceeding, in some cases, orders on extending the VAT uh, refund period were uh, subject to uh, to, to, to judici judicial control. In other cases, it was not subject to judicial control. So it was a very strange situation. And two years ago, the Supreme Administrative Court, court issued a resolution and said it can't be like this. All 
those orders issued by tax authority, uh, no matter what was the proceedings, should be uh, sub uh, should be subjected uh, over over the uh, sorry uh, over the control of administrative courts. Administrative courts also emphasize the role of uh, principle of trust. So this what, 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 what we were talking about some minutes ago, cooperation between tax authority. We don't have such a meaning. We have a pilot program uh, which is being prepared probably in the Ministry of Finance, but we don't have such a rule in, under Polish uh, tax law. But uh, administrative court said that there is something like trust in tax authority. That means that tax authority cannot uh, benefit <coughs> of the mistake the authority make. And we had a very, very interesting case before my court when a taxpayer, uh, against the taxpayer was issued a decision and decision, and the decision tax authority <coughs> said that uh, a taxpayer cannot uh, benefit from the relief because the taxpayer didn't fulfill the requirement uh, one condition was not fulfilled by the taxpayer. And a taxpayer come, came to the court and brought, <coughs> and brought information brochure showing us that the Ministry of Finance issued a brochure uh, contrary to the statute. So we had a very s specific situation. We have a statute saying that the, sh that the taxpayer should fulfill one condition, but the condition was not pointed out in the information brochure. So on the one hand, we had a source of law, an act passed by parliament saying that uh, if you want a taxpayer to, to have this uh, tax relief, you have to fulfill all those uh, conditions. But on the other hand, there was an information brochure issued by Ministry of Finance, but in the brochure one condition was missed. And we decided that the, that the decision was wrong. We repealed the decision and said, OK, a taxpayer cannot uh, be harmed by uh, tax, uh, tax authorities that made a mistake issuing a brochure without one condition. Of course, tax administration submitted a claim, uh, a complaint against the, 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 the judgment to the Supreme Administrative Court, but finally the Supreme Administrative Court uh, dismissed the, uh, the, the, the complaint, saying that we were right. So sometimes the law is not so important than the principle of trust in tax, uh, in tax authority. A taxpayer have the, uh, have the right to believe that tax authorities play fair. They don't uh, use, uh, they, they don't uh, use the mistake on their benefits. And another point, in my opinion, very important is that uh, Polish administrative courts are very active courts. They submitted uh, many questions, many requests to uh, Court of Justice of the European Union uh, to give preliminary <coughs> rulings. I checked before the conference. We have 47 uh, judgments or orders uh, delivered by the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union uh, the, in Polish cases, and some of them are still pending, uh, pending in the court. Most of them, maybe even all of them, were in favor of taxpayers. So, in fact. The request uh, referred to a situation where Polish tax uh, law was, uh, was contrary to the European regulation and, the con and uh, it harmed, in fact, taxpayers. And uh, the last thing I would like to focus on is uh, unification of application of tax law made by the, uh, administra the, the Supreme Administrative Court. Administrative, uh, the Supreme Administrative Court has a very important instrument in his hands, so-called resolutions, and resolutions are binding for all uh, adjudicating panels of all administrative courts. So, in fact, issuing such a, uh, such a resolutions, administrative court decides what is the meaning, what is the interpretation of uh, provision uh, that, that, that was, uh, for example, differently applied by courts or differently, differently applied by tax authorities. About procedural principles, I, I wouldn't like to say because we have a very long list of principles, but I suppose uh, that the list is almost the same in many countries. 
but uh, selected means of protection of uh, taxpayers right i will say on the top of the list the institution of tax interpretation in poland we have two different kinds of tax interpretation in fact we have so-called general interpretations uh, issued by minister of finance uh, they are used to unify to, 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 to unify the system of law and to, in fact, to interpret the provision generally for tax authorities. And we have individual interpretation uh, issued by, on request of a taxpayer or for the, of, on request of a applicant. And these interpretations are very important um, uh, for a taxpayer because adherence to the interpretation cannot harm the taxpayer, and even in some cases, adherence to the interpretation uh, causes that taxpayer is uh, relieved from the tax obligation. So it means, in fact, that the taxpayer shouldn't have to pay, uh, don't have to pay tax uh, if he uh, if he will act according to the tax interpretation issued in this particular uh, case. I mentioned before the principle of a judging in favor of taxpayer. The principle was introduced into provisions of Polish tax code as of uh, 1st January 2016. And I can give you the wording of this, of this article because it is, it is quite interesting. The wording is like this. Not able to remove doubts as to the content of tax law provisions shall be settled in favor of taxpayer. It is quite strange because uh, this provision uh, restricts in, fund the, in fact the applying, uh, the, uh, applying of this article only to the problems of interpreting tax law. So only when the doubts are as to the content of tax law. Not, for example, this article, in my opinion, cannot be applied in the situation when there are some doubts as to the facts. For example, and the tax authority has problem with establishing the facts. So this rule doesn't apply in this situation. Before the change of tax code, uh, in, in light of uh, judicial control, we had situation where the rule was much broader. So it was also applied to the situation when the problem was connected with establishing the fa facts, not only with uh, understanding the provision of tax of tax law. And uh, another uh, very important, in my opinion, uh, provision that helps to protect taxpayer rights is uh, the principle that interest uh, uh, of tax refund are equal to interest of tax area, so, uh, error, so the position of a tax uh, administration and position of a taxpayer is balanced. So the, 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 the highest uh, interest are, the, the highest of interest is exactly the same. So what are the threats? What are the threats? I point out, I pointed out, in fact, three, maybe four, uh, dangers to the system of uh, um, uh, protection of taxpayers' rights in Poland. As I said before that, in my opinion, one of the best instruments helping to protect to, to, to protect Polish uh, taxpayers' rights is institution of tax interpretation. Uh, interpretation. The institution uh, has been uh, restricted lately by two, uh, by two restrictions. First is that the tax authority does not issue an individual interpretation if the facts of the future event presented in the application correspond to an issue, to correspond to an issue subject to a general interpretation. On one hand, we can say it's okay. When there is a general interpretation, taxpayer doesn't have to ask about the same question and receiving interpretation. But there is one very important point that differs the situation. The point is that the general interpretation are not subject to control of administrative courts. Individual interpretation are subject to the control. So we have Strange situation. If the Ministry of Finance doesn't want to, uh, that doesn't want to issue individual interpretation, it's enough to issue a general interpretation and it stops the way to issue individual interpretation. And the, and the other exemption is that the tax authority does not issue an individual interpretation when the actual state presented by a taxpayer or future event is recognized by, by tax authorities as tax avoidance. 
So when reading the pres presented uh, facts by, uh, by an applicant, when reading it, tax authorities will recognize the fact as a tax avoidant. It is, it, 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 is, uh, it, it is the way that tax authority doesn't have to issue uh, individual interpretations. So in two very important situations, individual tax interpretation doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be issued. Another thing, and it was presented in the last two presentation, on Polish tax system still we don't have any amicable settlement of tax matters, so no tax agreement, uh, no mediations, no cooperations between tax authority and tax and taxpayers. Still, Polish proceedings is very formal, so we have on the one and on the one side we have tax authority, on the other side we have uh, tax uh, taxpayer and they are in fact fighting with each other, not cooperating. So th this is, in my opinion, the problem because it's, uh, it's uh, generating costs on one and on the, other, uh, on the other side of the proceedings. Long time. One, 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 one sentence. I have to finish, but I'm sorry. <laughs> and one sentence. Long time of resolving the, the tax case. It is, uh, uh, it is quite strange, but on the other hand, we can say it's great for Polish taxpayer because we, because we have two stages on the administrative proceedings uh, level and then two stages on the court proceedings level. But adding it together, we have a situation that before the court we have now cases for 2005, 2006, because the, the, the resulting of the case lasts very long on every single phase of this proceeding. So after Stepping four times, uh, the, the proceedings takes a lot of time. And the last point, uh, but I wouldn't say anything about it, is the position, of course, because they are in, uh, in the middle of reconstruction of Polish, uh, of Polish uh, judiciary system, generally speaking. So uh, it was constitutional call was touched by the reform. The Supreme Court of Justice was the, the Supreme Court was touched by the reform. Common cause were touched by the reform. Until today, the administrative courts of justice are outside this system. But we will see and we will watch what's going to happen. You might happen. be retired by tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I have no idea how to comment it. <laughs> I'm not in the age, but of course it can happen. It can happen. It can happen. Sorry. So, thank you for your attention. I would love to thank, I would like to thank Dominic because this is uh, something very inspirational. Uh, just to let you know that uh, we have, uh, with respect to the interpretations, we have something similar. However, the problem we are facing is actually that we uh, have situations where because it's two different bodies of the Ministry of Finance where one, when uh, opinions, interpretations are issued and when a taxpayer is audited, actually criminal charges are brought against the taxpayer who fully complied with the opinion. And this is what this is again, something which was not exceptional and this is why we have a provision which is probably unconstitutional but it still says that the interpretations of the Ministry of Finance are binding for the tax administration. This yeah. was the reason why this was, was uh, introduced, but still the, the law is written in a way which is not really clear how and when it's, it's mandatory for interpretation of the tax administration. But anyhow, it's uh, very interesting to, to learn from, from Polish experiences. We are now at the end, and uh, I would, this has been a long day, but I've really enjoyed it. I have to say that uh, keeping me awake for more than 15 minutes is, a, is, is an accomplishment and I've not fallen asleep once. So even when I was speaking and I usually fall asleep then. <laughs> so uh, it's been wonderful. I would like to thank uh, the speakers. I would like to thank you as the audience. And I would like to say all of our foreign guests, 525. So the locals can go home, but the <laughs> foreigners, 525 in front of the uh, Faculty of Law. Uh, we'll take a walk to the National Museum. Uh, there's a tour, and then after the tour, we go for dinner. Thank you. Sorry, yes. And we start tomorrow at 9. We begin with BAT.